On the 7th of March, 1936, Adolf Hitler sent 20,000 troops back across the Rhine River for the first time since the German army had left their guns behind them and fled in 1918. It had been a long time coming, and originally it was meant to be even longer. In Hitler's mind, 1937 was the perfect time. However, with the changing international situation, now was his chance. Mussolini had openly come out in April 1935 and condemned Germany as stressor with France and Britain and stated that he would oppose German rearmament and revanchism. Now, it appeared Hitler was surrounded with no way out. This situation quickly changed, however, when Mussolini blew up the entire thing in his own face. In October 1935, Mussolini sent his Italian army over the Ethiopian frontiers and the Brits reacted furiously. Economic sanctions were quickly imposed and Mussolini was left in the international wilderness. Hitler sent the Africans guns, knowing full well they wouldn't win, but he knew that prolonging the war would be worth it if it meant a distraction and then isolated Mussolini. Whilst the war continued to drag on down in Africa, Hitler made his move. Before we begin, a quick disclaimer. This is a video about Adolf Hitler, so by its very nature, it could potentially be controversial. I request that you please don't read too much into it. This video is purely a work of history, and I will express no political opinions of my own. Thank you. Also, this video is part of a larger series on the life of Adolf Hitler, from birth till death. You can easily watch this video as it is, but if you'd prefer to start from the start, then the link is in the description or on my channel homepage. And finally, a huge thank you to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who make these videos possible. Whilst these videos are monetized, it usually takes days to do so due to their controversial nature, which requires a manual review. As a result, I am entirely reliant on your kind subscriptions and donations, so if you do enjoy these videos and you'd like to support me, then please consider clicking one of the links in the description. Even the $2 tier helps immensely. Thank you. During the build-up to the great day when his troops would step across the line, Adolf had been unable to sleep at all. Over and over in his mind, he'd been plagued with what-ifs. He knew the English wouldn't act, that much was certain, but what of the French? If they showed even a token resistance, then the Germans were not at all prepared. In fact, they would be sent back on an embarrassing retreat. Hitler issued orders to this effect. If any resistance was spotted, stage a fighting retreat. He need not have overfought this hard. Whilst he had been planning for this situation for months, his opponents had not, and they were caught with their pants down. Hitler had deliberately chosen a Saturday to stage the invasion, as the British aristocrats would all be off at their country homes, as opposed to in Parliament. They would not return till Monday, and by then, he reasoned, the emotions would have calmed down, and the drama would have already unfolded. When the news of the invasion arrived in Berlin, the French ambassador urged a quote, energetic reaction, which inspired the French government to react. The army, however, was having none of it. General Gamelin said, quote, A war operation, however limited, entailed unpredictable risks and could not be undertaken without decreeing a general mobilization, and so the French settled for simply sending 13 divisions to the Maginot Line. After all, who was willing to risk their neck for the Rhineland? The occupation had already ended six years earlier, and it was German territory at the end of the day. Meanwhile, over 25,000 German troops had flooded across the Rhine, where they were greeted with rapturous applause. Priests awaited them, blessing them as they passed, and flowers were thrown at them by ladies wherever they went. Hitler, on the other hand, was still crippled by worry. He later reminisced, quote, The 48 hours after the march into the Rhineland were the most nerve-wracking in my life. We would have had to withdraw with our tails between our legs, for the military resources at our disposal would have been wholly inadequate for even a moderate resistance, end quote. Eventually, it became clear that the French would do nothing, and he took a tour of the reoccupied area before heading back home in a special train. He remarked, Good Lord, am I relieved how smoothly everything went? Yes, the world belongs to the courageous, God helps him. He then asked for some of his favourite Wagner to be played, and as he listened, he remarked that his Christian faith had been built out of Wagner's beautiful opera, before ending with, You can serve God only as a hero. Over in London, the Brits were only half bothered. After all, the deed had already been done. Lord Lothian's remark sums up the average Brit's thoughts at the time, quote, The Germans, after all, are only going into their own back garden. And the politicians felt helpless against the weight of public opinion. 
On the 12th of March, five days after the Germans had walked into their own back garden, the League of Nations Council met and passed a unanimous resolution condemning Germany as a treaty breaker. Some began to panic, including General von Blomberg. Hitler had to remind him that political matters were decided in the Reich Chancellery, not the War Ministry, and he was told not to meddle in political affairs ever again. In the end though, just a few hours later, word came from Ribbentrop in London that the crisis was over. Hitler had got everything he wanted and lost nothing by pure bluff. Even after his resounding success in the Rhineland, early 1936 was a stressful time for the Führer. His chauffeur, Julius Schreck, had just passed away. Schreck had been an old friend of Hitler's and had actually been a founder of the SS when it was just simply Hitler's bodyguard unit. When Emile Maurice, his old chauffeur, was exiled in shame from Hitler's inner circle to trying to seduce Hitler's niece, Schreck stepped in and served the Führer loyally until his recent death. As a result of this, and other recent events, Adolf could barely sleep. His doctor prescribed him some pills, and eventually he managed to settle into somewhat of a decent schedule at the Reich Chancellery. At night he would disappear into his extremely basic bedroom. The only decoration was an oil portrait of his mother on the wall. In the morning, he would shave and dress himself before emerging, where he would then meet Karl Kraus, his valet. The Führer would then eat a breakfast, which usually consisted of two cups of milk, 10 pieces of Zweibach and some chocolate. This was usually done in five minutes and he'd set off to his office for the day's work. The only relaxation time Hitler would get would be an almost nightly movie. Krauss would give him a list of films and ask the Führer to choose. If one bored him, he would exclaim, trash, and ask for the next one to be put on. One of his favorite films at the time was Lives of a Bengal Lancer, an American film depicting a group of British cavalrymen in British India fighting off rebellious natives Sir Ivone Kirkpatrick, a British diplomat in Berlin, recalls, quote, He liked this film because it depicted a handful of Britons holding a continent in thrall. That was how a superior race must behave, and the film was compulsory viewing for the SS. Over the coming weeks, Hitler's health showed no signs of improving, and he was suffering from a high buzzing sound in his left ear, which was troubling him greatly. His doctor advised him to head off on vacation to his mountain retreat, which he duly did, over the next few months, he would spend as much time as possible there. On the 22nd of July, Hitler's peace was disturbed, as two Germans who lived in Morocco appeared with a letter from a Spanish general named Francisco Franco. In the letter, Franco asked for the Führer's assistance in getting his army of Africa out of Morocco and across the Strait of Gibraltar. Hitler immediately summoned Goering, and the two agreed that it was in their best interest to support Franco for a variety of reasons. Goering said he wanted to in order to quote, test my young Luftwaffe, and that doing so would crush the Reds, preventing the spread of communism in Europe. Ribbentrop, on the other hand, advised Hitler against getting involved, as he feared quote, fresh complications with Britain, which would undoubtedly dislike German intervention. Hitler himself felt that it was his duty to stop the spread of communism in Europe. If Spain fell, he assumed, then would France, who already had a leftist regime, not be next? Wedged between the powerful Soviet bloc in the east and a strong Franco-Spanish bloc in the west, we could do hardly anything if Moscow chose to attack us, he said. He did have one serious moral dilemma about helping Franco at first, however. The troops he would be transporting from Spanish Morocco weren't just Spanish, but local too. These troops were known for their extreme brutality. For example, in the Asturian miners' strike of 1934, when they were brought to quell the strike, they frequently tortured prisoners and hacked them to death. Many of them were executed by the Spaniards for their crimes. In the end, Hitler was right, and much like had happened in the Rhineland when French colonial troops had moved in, Spanish colonial troops unleashed a wave of sexual crimes and extreme violence on the unfortunate Spanish population in the years of civil war to come. Hitler's moves, however, weren't all so well-intentioned. Hitler's most important reason for intervening was much closer to home, Hitler's homeland, Austria, was only able to maintain its shaky independence against the population's wishes due to the Austrian government's relationship with Italy. Mussolini had drawn a line in the sand several times. To him, Austria was his sphere of influence and his buffer state against the North. The Austrian Catholic regime was more than happy to go along with this 
if it meant protecting their unique Austrian culture, instead of it being, as they saw it, swallowed up by Hitler's united Germany. Mussolini had opposed Hitler at every turn up until now, but lately, with the Ethiopian fiasco, he had poisoned his relationship with the Allies. Now, Hitler reasoned, he could put the final nail in the coffin. If he made sure the rebellion in Spain got off the ground, Mussolini would become bogged down in a lengthy civil war, which to him had two benefits. The annihilation of any goodwill left between the Allies and Italy, and secondly, the Italians themselves would be weakened on the battlefields of Spain, leaving them in no position to resist Hitler's moves in Austria. Hitler took it a step further. Whilst the overwhelming majority of assistance went to the nationalists, it didn't only go to them. Hitler didn't want a quick war, he wanted a long, drawn-out one. Italian fascism must be bled white in Spain. For example, just one shipment of supplies on the 1st of October 1936 to the Republicans, Franco's enemies, were over 19,000 guns, 100 machine guns, and 20 million bullets. Obviously, Hitler still wanted the Reds to lose, so he made sure they were given the oldest guns possible in order to delay their defeat, not avoid it, much as he had done in Ethiopia. It must be remembered that despite all these moves, it's par for the course in the dirty game of foreign policy at the end of the day. Hitler had always been a great admirer of Mussolini, but the love had never been returned. For over a decade by this point, Mussolini had talked behind Hitler's back and opposed him. Despite all this, Hitler just felt that Mussolini was misguided and that he could be won around. Now, it appeared that this was the case. On October the 25th, Mussolini and Hitler signed a treaty of friendship in which they promised to pursue a common foreign policy, later known as the Rome-Berlin Axis. This so-called common foreign policy certainly didn't include Austria yet, however, as Hitler kept up his policy of weakening Italy, despite the sincere talk of friendship. The blocs that we all know from the Second World War were now beginning to be put solidly into place. England, not Italy, had been Hitler's dream alliance, but reality was now taking him in this direction. Hitler's bodyguard, Karl Wilhelm Krauss, during an interview, would recall the following. Hitler wanted, especially, to be on good terms with England. No one could control colonies like England did. They can, with just one hand, control millions of people. They, the English, know how to do that. And afterwards he said, the best soldiers will have to go with the worst soldiers. And he meant, of course, the Italians. And he said, at one time they had the Romans, but they don't have any Romans now. In 1931, before Hitler came to power, Berlin had beaten Barcelona to host the 1936 Olympics, and this led to a golden opportunity for Germany to show itself on the world stage, quite unlike anything before. The city was cleaned up a little bit for the international audiences. Julius Streicher's rapidly anti-Semitic newspaper, Der Stürmer, was removed from the stands. Anti-Semitic posters were taken down, as well as any reference to the Nuremberg Laws, or restrictions on Jews in general. The opening ceremony was on the 1st of August, and the clear blue sky was perfect for the occasion. Lenny Riefenstahl had been brought in once more to create a movie of the games, and just like last time, it was a smash hit, which was known for its revolutionary camera angles and filmmaking. Even today, it is highly acclaimed, and in a world of dated old black and white movies that seem unwatchable now, Olympia stands strong. Hitler led the parade to the stadium, protected by 40,000 brown shirts. When they arrived, the Führer then stepped into the biggest stadium in the entire world, followed by Tsar Boris of Bulgaria, the Crown Princes of Sweden, Greece and Italy, as well as Mussolini's sons. The orchestra blasted Deutschland über alle, the horse vessel lied, and then the Olympic hymn. 110,000 onlookers watched on enthusiastically and cheered when the Führer came into sight and took his place in the stands. Most of the delegations used the Olympic salute, however, the Austrians used the occasion to modify this to a Nazi salute. The greatest applause was for the French, who also had a Roman-esque salute, as opposed to the Olympic one, and the least applause was reserved for the Americans, who arrived without any enthusiasm or flair. To cover the entire games is a video of its own, but to summarise, the Germans ended up winning a resounding victory, both in the sporting sense and also the propaganda sense. The Germans took home 101 medals, including 38 gold ones. Whilst the second place Americans managed barely half with 57 medals, 24 of them being gold, 
The most famous story of the 1936 Olympics was Jesse Owens, the African-American runner who took home many gold medals. Hitler was unable to greet every winner of every event and did not end up meeting Owens properly. And this has been painted as a racist snub by Hitler. The reality could not have been further from the truth, however. Owens himself later said, quote, When I passed the chancellor, he arose, waved his hand at me, and I waved back at him. I think the writers showed bad taste in critiquing the man of the hour in Germany, end quote. In fact, despite winning four gold medals at the Olympics, he wasn't even invited to the White House and was largely ignored on his return to the USA. Owens would also remark that the greatest ovations he had ever received in his life were from the crowd in Berlin. It was also said that Hitler wanted the games to be a display of Aryan superiority and that Owens, who was obviously black, destroyed his plans by upstaging everyone. This narrative is also silly, as it's never mentioned who actually won the games that year by a gigantic margin. Hitler watched as many of the games as he could within the confines of his busy schedule, and he was glued to them with the interest of a passionate schoolboy watching his favourite sports team. He was overjoyed with how the Germans performed, and on the 16th, the games were brought to a close, whilst the crowd yelled out, Sieg Kyle, unser Führer, Adolf Hitler, Sieg Kyle." The visitors left the games impressed by Hitler's Berlin, and he couldn't have asked for a better advertisement for his beloved Germany. One event marred the end of the games in controversy, however. The man Hitler had chosen to erect and organise the Olympic village was Wolfgang Fernster, a Jew. However, before the games, he was dismissed because, quote, Fernster did not act with the necessary energy. After the games, Wolfgang attended the banquet in honour of his replacement, and then shot himself. The press claimed Wolfgang was only dismissed and driven to suicide due to his faith. But given that he was chosen in the first place, it's hard to say that this played any factor at all in his dismissal. After the Rhineland controversy, Hitler seemed to become more and more engrossed in foreign policy and tended to leave domestic matters to remain as they were, not making any drastic changes. He also reverted back to his old ways. Whenever he was extremely stressed, he would isolate himself and barely see anyone, much like in Vienna or when he got out of prison. Otto Dietrich, the party press chief, recounted, quote, He became markedly less ready to receive political visitors unless he had expressly sent for them. At the same time, he contrived to erect barriers between himself and his associates. Hitler could no longer tolerate objections to his ideas, or, in fact, anything which cast doubt on his infallibility, end quote. During an interview with Current History, he seemed as if he had aged massively since the interviewer saw him a year earlier. Hitler happily talked at length on topics such as music, his days in Vienna, or even the Night of the Long Knives, but refused to talk about his future, and Hitler seemed nihilistic. Instead, he talked of the Ober Salzburg and his mountain retreat. He said that only there could he, quote, breathe and think and live. I remember what I was and what I have yet to do. If only my strength lasts and God and fortune remain with me to the end. He talked similarly to his sister Angela, who was Hitler's housekeeper. He spoke as if his time was past, which perhaps had something to do with his endless fear of health problems. For the rest of his life, he would constantly worry about cancer claiming him, like it had to his mother. Resulting in him not being able to finish the work he felt he had been put on this earth for. Around this time, Hitler and his sister fell out over a few different things, which resulted in her giving up her post as housekeeper. She wanted to, and did, remarry, which Hitler didn't want, and she disliked Ava Braun, who she privately called the stupid cow. Angela wasn't alone in this dislike. Everybody around the Fuhrer either openly disliked Ava or found her incredibly annoying. Common criticisms were that she was extremely stupid, uninteresting, and self-obsessed. Everyone put up with her, however, due to their love of the Fuhrer, and they mostly kept their opinions to themselves, announcing them only in strict privacy or after the war. Hitler, on the other hand, was warming to Ava and began to include her a little more. He purchased her a new two-story house near her current apartment, which he had also brought for her. It was paid for via Hoffman, his photographer, who ended up spending 30,000 marks for the new place. Hitler never took a salary during his time in office, so these funds mostly came from donations or sales from his book. Regardless, he was a very wealthy man. He also moved her right into the Berghof, which was currently undergoing a total reconstruction. 
She was given a bedroom and bathroom adjoining his own room, and the summer residence had to be big enough to host high-level diplomatic negotiations. Martin Borman, who was making himself indispensable at this time, was given the task. Borman grated on those around him and was extremely controlling. Whilst he rose to the forefront, others dropped to the background, like Rosenberg and, most prominently, Ernst Hanfstegel, both of whom had been with Hitler since near the beginning. Hanfstegel had gotten a divorce from his wife, Helene, who Hitler was incredibly fond of. The Hanfstegels were Hitler's safe place back in the wilderness years and even earlier. When the beer hall putsch went downhill, it was the Hanfstegel household he ran to, where Helene had to talk him out of shooting himself. Now, though, Ernst, who was foreign press chief at the time, was being pushed more and more into the background. Ernst's endless criticism of the party was winning him no friends, and he always tried to push the party to take a safer and more palatable path, at least in the eyes of foreigners. He expressed his concerns to his 15-year-old son Egon, who Hitler had always been around, loved, and played with growing up. Boy, listen to what I have to say, and don't forget a word of it. Things are not well. We all believed in the movement, didn't we? I'm still trying to believe in it. At the rate we're going, we'll have a war. A war in which England and America will be against us. It's dangerous for Germany, and for the world. I've tried, God knows, to get at Hitler and warn him. It's no use saying that he just doesn't know what goes on. He must know, and if he knows, he must be held responsible." End quote. Ernst felt that members of the party, most likely referring to Goebbels, were out to get him. He had recently been framed for embezzlement, and quote, They failed, and I cleared myself completely, but they are not through. I expect to be fighting for life itself before long. They're almost certain to get around to liquidating me, sooner or later. End quote. Egon wasn't surprised, and he too felt that Hitler had changed and that bad things were coming. He suggested that his father should have left already. Ernst explained that it wasn't as easy as that. After all, he had helped bring the party to power, and his family had an extensive personal history with the Fuhrer. Quote, We're all responsible. The Foundation, 95% of the original aims are good. There is still a chance, he said. Regardless, they made contingency plans. If Ernst called his son and started a conversation with the word, perhaps, then it would be a signal for Egon to board a train to Switzerland. Quote, Pretend you notice nothing, but quietly walk out of the picture, and keep walking without delay. He was not even to tell his mother he was leaving. Six months later, the time came. Ernst was ordered to immediately board a plane that was waiting for him, and fly to Spain, apparently to protect the interests of German journalists there. When he was in the air, though, the pilot told him that he had to parachute over the Republican lines. Ernst was understandably shocked. Obviously, such a move was an absurd death sentence. The pilot explained that he was just following orders, but then suddenly an engine clattered and they landed at a small airfield. Ernst then used a phone and pretended to call Berlin for instructions. He came back and told the pilot that the Fuhrer had ordered him to return home. He then took the night train to Munich, and the next morning he took one to Zurich, Switzerland where he called his son, beginning with the word perhaps. Egon packed some clothes, a signed photo of Hitler, and most importantly, a gun into his overcoat, boarded a train, and then hid in the bathroom till they were across the border. Before midnight, father and son were reunited, and Ernst explained what had happened. The Fuhrer had sent him on a peculiar flight over Spain, in order for him to die on his mission, in a way that would allow the party to cover it up. This was just Ernst's recollection of events, however. The reality is much more strange. The mission was actually an extensive joke created by Goebbels and Hitler. They wanted to punish Ernst for his recent negative remarks about the quote, fighting spirit of the German soldiers in combat during the Spanish Civil War. The plane was actually just circling above Germany with false location reports being given an order to make it seem like the plane was actually heading closer and closer to Spain. When the joke had gotten the intended results, that being Ernst's shock at the orders, the pilot was to fake an engine problem and return home. This version of events is from Albert Speer's memoirs, who would know such things given that he was in Hitler's inner circle, and he would have absolutely no reason to lie. His entire post-war persona was the good Nazi, and he had already served 20 years in prison, so the idea that he would lie to make Hitler sound good is ridiculous. Plus, his version just makes more sense. <laughs> Back 
Back in mid-1936, however, Hitler and many Brits had not given up hope that the two countries could one day work together. One was historian Arnold Toynbee, who during a visit to Germany was invited personally by Hitler to a private meeting. Arnold left so impressed that he basically ran around telling everyone he could that the present view of Hitler was misinformed and that he could be trusted. The West just had to hear him out. He sent off letters to the Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary stating as much. Then, it was Lloyd George, the old Prime Minister from the Great War, who had campaigned with the slogan, Hang the Kaiser. Now, he was in Germany singing Hitler's praises. He was greeted warmly on the 4th of September at the Berghof. Lloyd George said, quote, I have always been interested in promoting good relations between our two countries, and I renewed my efforts after the close of the Great War, end quote. He wasn't lying. During the drama and intense emotions of war, the PM had indeed gone overboard much like everyone else. During the Versailles Peace Conference though, as time passed, he began to understand the German position and sympathise with them, especially as he fell out with his own allies like Italy and the new Eastern European nations. He felt Germany was a bastion of civilization amidst those who were not. He said to Hitler that an agreement must be reached between the two countries within the next few months. Otherwise, they would drift apart. Hitler was completely in his element, and felt as if he was speaking to a man who finally understood him. The two talked of how both nations came from a common racial stock, even though Lloyd George himself was actually Welsh, not English. The menace to the future, they both agreed, was communism. He expressed concern about Spain, and the fear that if Franco lost, this would be but the first domino to fall. Later, they came to the topic of the Great War, Hitler spoke of the time when England was on the point of surrendering, quote, I told Lloyd George I believed this, and that the disaster for Germany was that we surrendered at five minutes to twelve. Lloyd George agreed, and Hitler recalled, quote, I told him that if ever there was another war between Germany and England, Germany will fight until five minutes after twelve, so long as I am Führer. Later, as Lloyd George got to his hotel entrance, his daughter jokingly called out, Heil Hitler, with a salute. Lloyd George didn't even smile, and replied in all seriousness, Certainly, Heil Hitler. I say it too, for he is really a great man. During his trip, Lloyd George attended the Nuremberg rally of that year, and he was incredibly impressed. In front of 160,000 brown shirts and SS men, Hitler spoke about the communist menace, and the foreign guests had never seen such a spectacle. One of these guests, on the way to lunch with Hitler afterwards, stated, quote, By the time we got there, I was suffering from megalomania too. I decided I must be 10 feet tall, even if the cheering wasn't for me. During a talk with the small group for lunch, the Führer could barely continue speaking with the incessant chants of, we want to see our Führer in the background, until he went over to acknowledge his admirers. The next day, the guests were swept off their feet even more. The last day of the rally featured a mock aerial battle and a demonstration of the latest anti-aircraft guns as well as a mechanised battle in an arena. Lloyd George was completely overcome with emotion by the trip, and when he returned, he penned an article for the Daily Mail, stating that Hitler had single-handedly raised Germany from the depths. He was born a leader of men, he said, a dynamic personality with resolute will and dauntless heart who was trusted by the old and idealised by the young. Further south, Mussolini was, or was nearing, political isolation. Hitler reached out and tried to, in his eyes, make the Duce see sense. He sent Hans Frank, his lawyer and loyal party member, to Rome with an invitation. As Hitler expected, Mussolini was now genuinely interested. After all, it was mutually beneficial. He had soured his relations with the Brits, and Germany also had revanchist aims, just like Italy. So really, it was his only logical option. Count Ciano, Italy's foreign minister and Mussolini's son-in-law, met Hitler at the Berghof, and Hitler turned on the charm. Mussolini is the first statesman in the world, with whom no one else has the right, even remotely, to compare himself, Hitler said. He then went on to say that the Germans and the Latins complemented each other. Together, they would be an invincible coalition against the capitalists and the communists, he explained. Mussolini, according to his son-in-law, was up to the same game as Hitler. Ciano's task was to drive a wedge between Germany and England, Mussolini gave Ciano a document that was supposedly from the British ambassador in Berlin to London. It stated that the Hitler government was one of dangerous adventurers, to which Hitler angrily shouted, 
According to the English, there are only two countries in the world today which are led by adventurers, Germany and Italy. But England too was led by adventurers when she built her empire. Today, she is governed merely by incompetence. In the end, their new relationship was ironed out, and Mussolini made his famous speech, quote, This Berlin-Rome line is not a diaphragm, but rather an axis, around which can revolve all those European states with a will to collaboration and peace, end quote. If the alliances of the future war weren't clear before, they certainly were becoming so now. This new official friendship didn't stop Hitler from his plan in Spain, however. A representative appeared from Franco, urgently begging for more help, and he said that if it didn't come, then disaster could be imminent. Goering suggested that although unofficial, Germany was now basically at war anyway and should go all in. Hitler urged caution, and so did the army. If Spain was on the verge of disaster, Hitler reasoned, then he would increase the aid. But for now, what they were giving, which was a lot, was fine. The last thing Hitler wanted was a quick Franco victory, and he stuck rigidly to his plan. He told his generals semi-openly what he was up to with Mussolini. He told them that Mussolini alone would be allowed the honour of sending troops in force to Spain. What he really meant by that needs no explanation. Hitler's foreign policy in 1936 certainly seemed to be going well. Towards the tail end of the year, one rather large issue cropped up, however. Edward VIII, the man who had been crowned King of England only in January, was now engulfed in a crisis. He sought to marry Mrs. Wallace Simpson, a double divorcee, an American socialite. Neither of these things, or anything about Mrs. Simpson in general, seemed even remotely appealing to the British establishment, never mind the church. If I can marry her as king, well and good, the king said to Prime Minister Baldwin. He followed up by saying that if he could not, however, then he was prepared to go. This state of affairs absolutely horrified Ribbentrop, the German ambassador in London, who made sure to stress the importance of the situation to the Fuhrer. He's our greatest hope, he exclaimed to a German press agent. He was right. Edward was a huge Germanophile, and without him on the throne, Hitler's great dream of an alliance with Britain was just that, a dream. At first, Hitler refused to believe that the abdication was anything more than typical British tabloid nonsense. Ribbentrop too was reassured by his Fuhrer's confidence. Quote, You'll see. The Fuhrer will be proved right. The whole affair will go up in smoke and the king will be grateful to us for having treated the crisis with such tactful reticence. On December the 9th, Edward made a speech to his subjects to inform them that he was unable to, quote, carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king, as I wish to do, without the help and support of the woman I love, end quote. That morning, he had signed the instrument of abdication and was officially the first British monarch in history to voluntarily give up the throne. Hitler couldn't believe it, and fell into a brief depression. He phoned Ribbentrop and said, Now that the king has been dethroned, there is certainly no other person in England who is ready to play with us. Report to me on what you've been able to do. I shan't blame you if it amounts to nothing. On January the 30th, 1937, Hitler addressed the Reichstag on the fourth anniversary of his swearing in as chancellor. He stated, quote, Today I must humbly thank Providence, whose grace has enabled me, once an unknown soldier in the war, to bring to a successful issue the struggle for our honour and rights as a nation, before continuing to talk about his upcoming plans for Germany. 1936 had changed everything for Hitler. He had made his first major foreign policy gamble by marching into the Rhineland, and he finally had Mussolini on side. The only issue, as always, was his united dream of an alliance with Britain the nation he admired more than any other. It hadn't been all cheer, however, as with the success came the stress, and it was telling on Hitler's face. This was just the start, as from now, things would only get a lot more stressful for Hitler, and by 1945, he looked unrecognisable to those around him. For now, however, he carried on with his work and his grand plans. He set to work on the Autobahn, his project to connect the nation via a network of extensive high-speed roads, and in order to fill these roads, he set to work on finding someone to create his dream of the people's car, aka the Volkswagen, which was meant to be affordable and compact, so that almost anyone could acquire one. He also spoke of city planning, one of his favourite pastimes, especially with Speer, his architect. Underground car parks, traffic-free centres, parks and green areas, huge statues, monuments and more. His dreams weren't just in the cities, but in the small towns too. He said, quote, I am delighted to see our architects planning on broad and spacious lines, 
Only thus shall we avoid the springing up of more towns in which the houses are cluttered up, almost on top of each other, as one sees in Zwickau, Gelsenkirchen, and so on. If I were banished to a town of this kind, devoid of all beauty, I should lose heart and happiness just as surely as if I had been banished from my fatherland. I am therefore determined that some measure of culture and beauty shall penetrate even into the humblest of our towns, that, step by step, the amenities of all of our towns will reach the highest level." End quote. Hitler's revolution was total and overwhelming. It affected every aspect of society. For example, the school curriculum was completely overhauled. As much as five hours a day were spent on physical training, as well as racial biology classes being introduced. The history classes had become incredibly German-centric, in order to make the student feel like he was part of a larger whole, stretching back millennia. One teacher described the new way of doing things as follows, quote, we don't intend to educate our children into becoming miniature scholars. Therefore, let us have, rather, 10 pounds less knowledge and 10 pounds more character. At the center of this new way of doing things was, as always, Adolf Hitler. And the teachers made sure that the students knew that it was he who had changed Germany, in their eyes, for the better. In Cologne, one such song at school, which pushed the boundaries of heresy, was as follows. Führer, my Führer, bequeathed to me by the Lord, protect and preserve me as long as I live. Thou hast rescued Germany from deepest distress. I thank thee today for my daily bread. Abide thou long with me, forsake me not. Führer, my Führer, my faith and my light, hail, my Führer. To foreign spectators, such things, perhaps understandably, seemed a little peculiar and intimidating. But at the end of the day, only the Germans themselves understood their current situation and what they had been through in order to get to the current standard of living they had now. British Ambassador Phillips reported back to London, quote, The German schoolboy is being methodically educated, mentally and physically, to defend his country. But I fear that, if this, or a later German government, ever requires it of him, he will be found to be equally well fitted and ready to march or die on foreign soil, end quote. He wasn't wrong. The training of the youth was total, and their mission was drilled into them constantly. In Hitler's eyes, the German people had to be strong and united in order to defend Germany from such humiliations as happened in 1918. No matter where the future took them as a people, they must be able to protect themselves. It began early on in the Jung Volk, an organisation preparing boys of 10 to 14 to become a part of the Hitler Youth. The author of a booklet on the Jung Volk, or Young Folk, wrote, the Jung Volk is the newly won element of eternity, in inexorable truth. For us, an order and an imperative are the most sacred duties. For every order comes from the responsible personage, and that personage we trust, the Führer. So we stand before you, German father, German mother, we, the young leaders of the German youth, we train and educate your son, and mould him into a man of action, a man of victory. He has been taken into a hard school, so that his fists may be steeled, his courage strengthened, and that he may be given a faith, a faith in Germany." End quote. Once a child graduated from the Jung Volk into the Hitler Youth, he could officially wear the brown shirt, and he would be given a dagger which had the words blood and honour engraved on it. Even at a younger level, somehow, the party had overhauled things to such a level that it again impressed foreigners. Sir Arnold Wilson, a British MP, wrote, "'Infant mortality has been greatly reduced, and is considerably inferior to that in Great Britain. Tuberculosis and other diseases have noticeably diminished. The criminal courts have never had so little to do, and the prisons have never had so few occupants. It is a pleasure to observe the physical aptitude of the German youth. Even the poorest persons are better clothed than was formerly the case, and their cheerful faces testify to the psychological improvement that has been wrought within them." End quote. Another notable aspect of the years leading up to, and then the actual rule of the NSDAP, is how many workers they managed to swing from being rabid communists to die-hard national socialists. This was no propaganda trick. These people had been a part of perhaps the fastest change in working conditions that the world had ever seen. Under the slogan, beautification in every place, the factories, offices, and even bathrooms of Germany were completely revamped. Everything was kept perfectly clean. More windows were added, less crowding, flowers littered every patch of grass and were visible outside every window. Robert Ley's Strength Through Joy program gave workers subsidized or free concerts, theater performances, dances, films, and courses of all kinds. The most famous of all was the subsidized tourism. Even the poorest of German workers and their families, who just a few years prior had been starving and reduced to begging on the streets, could now head off on a cruise to the Norwegian fjords, or even as far as the Portuguese island of Madeira in the Atlantic. Ley, 
the leader of the DAF, the German Labour Front, said, The worker sees that we are serious about raising his social position. He sees that it is not the so-called educated classes whom we send out as representatives of the new Germany, but himself, the German worker whom we show to the world, end quote. When Hitler said to the Reichstag during the fourth anniversary speech, quote, a radical transformation has taken place and has produced results which are democratic in the highest sense of the word, if democracy has any meaning at all. On these cruises, there was no brutal class separation like in Britain, most famously seen in films like the Titanic. In Germany, the idea was that there was no class, there was just the Germans, and Hitler and Ley especially set out to make this idea a reality. The Führer said in one interview, the bourgeois must no longer feel himself a kind of pensioner of either tradition or capital, separated from the worker by the Marxist idea of property, but must aim to accommodate himself as a worker to the welfare of the community, end quote. Even Hitler himself was displayed as a worker and an artist, a man who ate with his chauffeurs and who lived a Spartan life and ate simple meals. Hitler refused all honorary doctorates from universities. He owned no stocks, he rented out no property. He took no salary and would regularly visit factories where he would seamlessly mingle with the workers as if he was one of them. In a way, he was. Hitler, as we know, had been homeless for years and he knew what the bottom felt like. He had no ego to boost or point to prove. He only ever had one mission and that was to the German people, for better or for worse. Whether that be improving working conditions for his people or invading Poland to unite his people, which ended up causing the biggest war in history. Apart from class differences, there was the regional differences between the German states to remove. It must be remembered that Germany, in its present form, was a new nation, only becoming united in 1871. Separatism was present in different states to varying degrees, most of all in Bavaria. When Hitler launched the Beer Hall Putsch, which failed, this was partly rushed due to his fear that those he were overthrowing were about to proclaim an independent Bavaria. Now, however, he was succeeding. Even Hitler's biggest critics had to admit as much. American diplomat George Keenan wrote, Germany has simply been unified and thoroughly so. What Bonaparte and Napoleon III left undone in this direction, Versailles completed, and Hitler is now stamping out the last vestiges of particularism and class differences. That he is doing this by reducing everything to the lowest and most ugly common denominator is neither here nor there. German unity is a fact. Hitler may go, but the unity will remain, and with it, barring outside influence, will remain, must remain, the jealousy, the uncertainty, the feeling of inferiority, the consequent lust to dominate Europe, which are all that most Germans really have in common, end quote. Even in terms of the economy at large, it was all about unity and pushing the German people forward. Hitler brushed off economic concerns from Hjalmar Schacht, the Minister of Economics, and those of big industrialists. To him, it was all simply a matter of willpower rather than economic theory cooked up in some office by experts. At the 1936 Nuremberg rally, Hitler announced his four-year plan, and he chose Goering to administer it. Curiously, Goering was the only party member Hitler chose for the plan. Goering stepped up to the task with vigour and got to work. In a speech calling for national mobilisation, in the sense of the people all working towards a common goal, he stated that workers and peasants must apply their full strength. Inventors must place themselves at the disposal of the state, and businesses must, quote, think not of profit, but of a strong, independent national German economy, and that, quote, each one of us should ask himself every day what he can do, how he can contribute to the success of the common effort, end quote. Goering pressed the industrialists onwards, and Hitler urged them to listen to him. Autarky, aka an economic system where the state is self-reliant and doesn't need to rely on international trade, was the main priority, not each individual business's profits. Goering said to them that it was no longer a question of producing economically, but a question of simply producing. Schacht was furious and began to speak openly against the party to the same industrialists. He had always been a strange fit, as he was more of an international type and certainly didn't seem to care about the German people as a whole, but rather about himself and those in his circle. After the war, he would write an autobiography in which he nicknamed himself The Wizard in the title, Within a few months, Schacht was forced out, and Goering marched forwards with no opposition. If Hitler had died now, in 1937, he would have gone down in history very, very differently. He was brought up frequently when it came to the Nobel Peace Prize, and the following year, he would win Time's Man of the Year. In the eyes of many, he had changed Germany from a backwards, depraved land of homelessness and degeneracy 
into perhaps the most advanced state on earth. Men, such as Sven Hedin, the world-famous Swedish explorer, spoke glowingly of him, quote, a man who within the space of four years has raised his people from the very lowest depths of self-consciousness, pride, discipline, and power, deserves the gratitude of his fellow citizens and the admiration of all mankind, end quote. As well as just words of praise, those seeking to emulate him popped up in every Western country, as well as even in Eastern ones. In China, Chiang Kai-shek spoke of how fascism was the future and how it had saved Germany and Italy. Now, in his eyes, it could save China. Oswald Mosley openly copied the NSDAP in Britain, and in Belgium, you had Leon de Grel's Rexist movement, which whilst having more of a Catholic twist, was extremely similar to Hitler's. However, as we know, this isn't the Hitler that went down in history, and he certainly isn't remembered for his remarkable economic and social achievements. Whilst we are currently in the year 1937, and he would only have eight more on this earth, the coming eight years would change the course of not only his reputation, but world history as we know it, forever. Thank you very much for watching. If you did enjoy this video, then please do leave a like and a comment. It helps immensely with pushing these videos out there, as they of course take a long time to make. As always though, the biggest thanks goes to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who make these videos possible with their kind subscriptions. My videos, for now, sadly begin unmonetized, and they need to be manually approved, so the vast majority of any proceeds from these videos come from those kind of websites, and I cannot thank those of you who choose to donate to me enough. If you'd like to join our Discord, our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, or if you'd just like to support the channel, then please do click the link in the description. Even the $2 tier helps more than you can imagine. Thank you to Lobster to You, Darway Lolololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Friendly Brian, Mr. Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, Ethan Wynn Stanley, Wunderwaffe, Mr. Bloom, Gav D, Gaius Longanid Hanno, JD, Green Rebel, Angus Roxborough, Rocksacker Too Heavy, Alexios Podcast Watcher, Citadel, Haste, Bojan M, Rick Me, Mr. Gaming, Cameron, Sludwig1919, Gloomy, It's Okay to Be a Nationalist, Inflection Point, Eric235628, The Wooler, and How did they, how does this go when we pronounce it? Listen. Wait. Alright. Okay, you do it then. Me? Yeah, come on. You're gonna pronounce this for me. <laughs> I don't know what the hell. How do you say that? Sumo Klubu, right? Sumo Klubu Yek. Okay. <laughs>